Well, hello, boys and girls from around the world. It's Timmy, or Timothy, or Tim, or Timmy, whatever you want to call me, I don't care. Uh, I'm gonna start this. I'm gonna do things a little different, but there's my buddies. Oh, all right, check this out. Okay, so I wanted to say, this is Tina and Pepe. Tina! Tina's got the jerry curl, but you can't see it because she's, um, she's been shaved. Oh. So, Pepe's the boy, Tina's the girl. I think that's Tina. I think that's Pepe. I think so. I always get them mixed up, and there's easier ways to tell, but, um, whenever this field's grown up, I like to do this. I don't bring treats, I just give them what they want on the other side. The grass is always greener, right? We talked about that before, so... Uh, I'm gonna do things a little different today. We're gonna do the, um... We're gonna do the devotional first, then the psalm. Because I read the psalm, a little bit of it, I didn't want to get ahead of ourselves. And the psalm was really cool, and it's basically like a song prayer, so... I think we'll just do the psalm and go right into a prayer. I think that'd be a cool way to do it. So, and this is electric fence, so I've been shocked on this a couple times. It's no fun, but that's Cookie. Cookie's the female horse, and uh, Pokey is the male horse. So, just so y'all know, these are not my horses. This is not my property, but I've been invited to come when I want to spend time with the animals and I'm thankful for the opportunity and well y'all see me walk from my house over here dang buddy now the donkeys are a lot better about not biting my fingers off on the process the horses though they go crazy they'll bite your finger they don't care although it didn't taste good so not not finger licking good um so yeah, that's the that's the plan. Let's go ahead and get to it or I'll, I mean they'll sit here and eat all day. And we're losing light. <laughs> so um I think I wanted I think her name's Christy. Or I mean Melanie. I think it's Melanie. I've got a friend of mine from Facebook named Angel. And I think today's her five-year cancer anniversary, or I don't even know how to say it, but she survived cancer. And she seems to be like a really super nice woman. And she has some really cool things going on, I think in Arkansas. But um, she has a friend, I believe the name's Melanie, but Melanie lost her uncle. I think it's uncle. And the, um, the shooting in Louisiana. So she wanted to ask for prayers for her friend. And of course, that's a tragic situation. I've got a feeling we're gonna see a lot more of that kind of tragedy, so. You never get used to those kinds of things, actually. Got the other gate shut, so it's... Oh. Pokey! Cookie! Uh, let's go say hi. It's for you, Wilson. Cookie! Cookie. She got the blue eye, and she banged her head on the wall on accident, I think. So she's got a little gash, but they took care of it really well. Now, there's a couple videos where you can see the donkeys eating uh, the name off the wall. It's really weird. It used to say, Jesus saves. She likes it when you scratch her butt. Um, that was really weird. I love that windmill. Um, but yeah, so it's a tragic event. So we'll we'll pray for them later. But I just wanted to put that in the mind. So we're not praying just for her and the uncle and their family, but everybody involved because that's a pretty big deal. So and it falls in line with the weekend. The weekend was three day ritual. This, I think, would have been the fourth day, though, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, then one thing about the three-day rituals that the Darksiders do is usually the third day is human sacrifice. Depending on how it lines up, it could be the first, second, and third day. 
And one thing that I've figured out or put together is that depending on the time zones, you can extend it to a five day or six day ritual depending on the time zones. So just cause it's a day over here, like for instance, it's already Monday over in Europe, um, but it's still Sunday here. Well, hello. Well, hello. We might have company for this one, so this might get interesting. Kind of like a donkey's delight. It's a cool video I made, and uh, it was very delightful. So, hate the selfies, but I got tired of not showing myself, so. Uh, I changed my icon from the, uh, you'll probably rub horse dirt on my face, I don't care. Um, from the acorn that had no eyes, somebody said it looked soulless, so I thought that was like, we don't want to have the soulless icon. Hey, your breath smells like that grass, homie. Actually it smelled kind of pleasant. Um, surprisingly. Sure, my breath doesn't smell as good, but a little coffee never killed nobody, right? All right, guys. Um, the evening devotional is going to be from First Kings chapter 18, verse 40, and it says, "Let no one, or let not one of them escape." And uh, it's First Kings 18:40. Mr. Spurgeon says, When the prophet Elijah had received the answer to his prayer, and the fire from heaven had consumed the sacrifice in the presence of all the people, he called upon the assembled Israelites to take the priests of Baal, or Baal, um, B-A-A-L, which means Lord, but uh, the priests of Baal, I say Baal, so I'm probably butchering it but that's what I say and I'm gonna keep saying it so um, but yeah so the Israelites should take the priests of Baal and sternly cried let not one of them escape okay I remember this story a very interesting uh, he took them all down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there so must it be with our sins they are all doomed not one must be preserved our darling sin must die. Spare it not, for it is much crying. Strike, though it be as dear as an Isaac. Isaac was the firstborn of Abraham that was to be sacrificed, that the angel stopped the sacrifice. God wanted to see if Abraham was willing to go all the way. It's an image of Christ, except for that wouldn't have been atoning. Uh, but God gives and God takes, so they weren't even supposed to have a kid anyways. But you've got Ishmael and Isaac are the two offspring of Abraham direct. And there's a story in that. I talk about it in Ishmael's Flying Pigs and Pigs Come to Those Who Wait. Those two videos, I think, cover it. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Okay, so spare it not, for it is much crying. Strike, though it be as dear as an Isaac or an only begotten son. Um, strike, for God struck at sin when it was laid upon his own son. With stern, unflinching purpose must you condemn to death that sin which was once the idol of your heart. An idol is anything that comes before you and God. Anything that you devote your time or attention or energy to more than you do to God. An idol can be your phone, your TV, your video game, uh, you name it. It can be anything. It can be your job, even. Um, so, do you ask? Do you ask how you are to accomplish this? Jesus will be your power. You have grace to overcome sin. Given you the covenant of grace, you have the strength to win the victory in the crusade against inward lusts. Don't eat my pocket, buddy. Um, you have grace to overcome sin given you in the covenant of grace. You have strength to win the victory in the crusade against inward lusts because Christ Jesus has promised to be with you even unto the end. And if you would triumph over darkness, set yourself in the presence of the Son of Righteousness. 
Now that's S-U-N of righteousness, and that's Jesus. So, uh, Jesus is not the Son. Okay, I just want to make that clear. But this is distinct. Uh, this is a distinct Son of righteousness. There is no place so well adapted for the discovery of sin and recovery from its power and guilt as the immediate presence of God. Job never knew how to get rid of sin half so well as he did when his eye of faith rested upon God. And then he abhorred himself, or hated himself, uh, detested. It's a, abhor is a very strong word. And, oh, hey buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, hey, can't eat the book, guys. <laughs> I love this. Uh, because Jesus is pump. Uh, Job never knew how to get rid of sin half so well as he did when his eye of faith rested upon God, and then he abhorred himself and repented in dust and ashes. Um, the fine gold of the Christian is often becoming dim. Sorry. The fine gold of the Christian... <laughs> These guys want some attention, don't they? Um... Okay, the fine gold of the Christian is often becoming dim. We need the sacred fire to consume the dross. To consume the dross, let us fly to our God. He is a consuming fire. Wow, I think I mentioned that earlier this morning in the proverb. That's awesome. I mean, the scripture says it, but I, it didn't say that in the scripture. It said God tries the hearts, but it was talking about purifying gold and silver. So that's really, really cool confirmation right there so he is a is a consuming fire he will not consume our spirit but our sins and let the goodness of God excite us to sacred jealousy and to a holy revenge against those iniquities which are hateful in his sight go forth to battle the Amalek in his strength and utterly destroy the accursed crew let not one of them escape so Amalek was a, a forefather of the Amalekites, I believe he was a giant, or a Nephilim, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, there I think there was, it could be that um, An Anok or Amalek, I think there's two Amaleks, but there's a cool study in that if you want to do that. Um, one of them was old school from Abraham's time and one was with Moses, and if it's the same guy, he'd have to be living a really long time, which I find interesting. Um, the thing to point out here, um, is that he's, equi he's equating these enemies of God to sins, right? And these people aren't sins, they're sinners, but they were the heathens, uh, or the people that were directly opposed to God. They just weren't, they weren't just non-believers, they were haters, which is different. It's one thing if you don't believe in God, it's another thing to be directly opposed to Him. Like, for instance, the servants of Baal or Baal, um, those guys were literally all destroyed. Like you said, let not one of them escape. Uh, that happens more often than once. Uh, there's one of the kings who got righteously indignant when he came, and he basically got all of the prophets and priests of the false god that were working iniquity in Israel had him come to the temple for a meeting, and then he burned them all alive. It might not have been the temple, but I mean, I'm pretty sure it was. That's a cool story. But over and over again, like to cleanse out this situation, it's literally, you consume them all. And usually it's by fire, um, or by the sword. And so you think about, uh, Jesus came to divide, not unify, and he comes with a sword. That scripture is often used out of context. If you put it together, if you are having the truth, it divides truth from untruth. And there's only one absolute truth, and that's Christ. Jesus is the truth. Um, the scripture talks about when he was going to get um, when he was going to get crucified. He had Pontius Pilate ask him, "What is truth?" And uh, that was an interesting question to ask, because why would he ask Jesus what is the truth? Like, is he some philosophical master that knows better than the Greeks did? Do you think the Romans would take, you know, a, 
a carpenter's son from Nazareth's word over what truth is over a Socrates or uh, Aristotle or somebody like that. I find it very interesting. That's one way you can tell Pontius was starting to consider the possibilities, right? Um, so yeah, I'm kind of losing my train of thought, obviously, but this is fun. Um, it's a beautiful sunset too. You can't see the orange tones in there, but if you could, you'd be like, ooh, ah. So, um, where were we? So yeah, the Sons of Thunder, which is, you know, the title intro, or what I want to start, I think what I want to go by on the, the show I'm going to start, um, they're rough around the edges, and they're a little quick to get fiery, but what's interesting about the Sons of Thunder is they were taking their image of being a Son of Thunder calling down fire from heaven some would say is lightning and so where you have thunder you have lightning at one point to defend Jesus is I think James and John um, they were like you know hey do you want us to call down the fire from heaven to consume these these cats and Jesus is kinda like uh, no we need to offer a little grace he's like uh, he said I know what spirit that is or something along those lines I mean there's not much said about it but it, it draws directly from this story Basically, Elijah, as the prophet of God, um, ends up having a not a magic battle, but they have a sacrifice offering to Baal or Bel, and uh, he's got an offering to God, and they're like, okay, well, we'll see whose God's more powerful, and God sent fire to consume the offering right off of the altar. And so because he won, he's like, okay, now we'll kill all of the false prophets. And so that was really cool. Um, I mean, I'm not saying murdering and killing is cool, but... I'm saying getting your enemies wiped out is cool. And that's what Mr. Spurgeon is doing, is he's taking those analogies and overlaying them into our understanding of how on a day-to-day -day basis, it's sin ultimately is our number one enemy. And I talked to this morning, our spirit is very willing to serve God and to do right. And our flesh is very weak. And even Paul in Romans often says, that he, oh, no, I shouldn't say often, but he mentions multiple times he's a chieftain of sinners. Um, the things he wants to do, he can't. The things he knows he should do, he can't. Uh, the things he knows he shouldn't do, he does. And so, I love you too, guys. Um, so it turns out to be one of those things where, um, I don't know, Paul acknowledged that he wasn't perfect and at times was hypocritical and that he knew better but held himself to a higher standard and so I think we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard because if we do then we'll be uh, keeping ourselves honest once we start to justify and make a way for sin then it's a lot easier to not see it as an enemy um, I think he said our darling sins which is I think everybody has their affinities or um, you know has their weaknesses or chinks in what it is that their heart desires when it's not good or godly everybody has a everybody has a kryptonite I guess not to use I hate to use that analogy but for Superman that's like one of his only weaknesses so you know I would say well I won't say actually um, I might get myself in trouble uh, but yeah I've got my kryptonite so that's for sure I'm sure y'all can think of your own so go to God because Jesus is where those things the grace that he gave on the cross is what's sufficient for you and me we're not going to beat it on our own we're going to have to seek God and take it to him and give it to him this morning's devotional said you know if you're looking for your election don't look for your election if you're looking for a confirmation of your election don't admit that you're a sinner to God and give it to God and let, let your seeking Him um, be your election because you're choosing to be elected but God chooses you. you I think it's a two way street I know theologically some would say you have no free will God picks and chooses everything and dictates um, some would say free will is the number one thing and that you can't be saved unless you choose to have faith it's a very meaty, meaty disagreement. And I've seen good arguments and had great people that believe in Christ and ha know about salvation, have salvation as far as I can tell, and they don't agree on that theology. 
I don't like to disagree. I like to focus on what we agree on. So I wouldn't want to teach anybody wrong, but I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just telling you what I believe, and I could I could be wrong. So I don't want to lead anybody astray. Um, but having said all that, I would um, I would say if there's nothing wrong with giving your sin to God and confessing them to God. You don't have to confess them to a man or a woman. You know, you don't have to go give an altar call. But what what could it hurt? A lot of people would say, well, you have false converts if you go to the altar call. Well, if you're feeling the Holy Spirit resonate with you, hey, hey, stop. If you're feeling the Holy Spirit resonate with you, there's nothing wrong with acting on it, you know? So if God's calling you to come up to the altar, if you're at a church experience, and God's saying, hey, come up here and let's let's have an intimate moment, who would say no to an intimate moment with God? Some people would say, well, you're saved the second you're sitting in the pew and have faith. Okay, well, sometimes your faith is solidified by going and humbling yourself before the Lord. And it doesn't have to include other people, but it can. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. You know, but I'm just a guy. So, you know, you don't have to listen to me. But have an intimate experience with God if you can find one. Don't be that way, buddy. She said that they'll raise their nose all the way up to lock in the smell, so they'll remember your smell forever. Ah. Okay, so this is getting interesting. Um, I totally lost my train of thought, too. So um, This is an intimate moment with God I'm having right now through these animals and with you guys, and I'm pleased to share it with you. This is uh, not, they don't normally behave this way. They're usually more skittish and want to run off and they won't let you touch their face and play with them and pet them. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't resist it. But I don't want them to start kicking me or biting my head or something, which they might do that. It'll be fun. They have such sad eyes, too. Um, okay, so. Have faith. Go to God. Take your sins to Jesus. If you've sinned again, repent. Turn away. Change your mind. Uh, decide something else. Follow a different path. If it didn't work before, um, then why would it work now? Or if it's not, if you think it's working, well, see how long that works out for you. If you're going to do it without God. You know, don't cover up your sin and hide it. You know, offer it up to God and humble yourself. Don't get filled with pride thinking, well, I can get away with this this sin and that sin, but uh, these other ones I'm willing to admit to. You know, be honest with yourself first, is what I would say. Um, yeah. Okay, so Psalm chapter 17, verse 1 says, Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goes not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let the words out of my mouth come straight from his presence. That's what that means. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved my heart, though thou hast visited me in the night. It is evening, isn't it? You're being visited right now. Um, thou means you, so just in case you wanted to know what old English says thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing okay you have tried me God and you shall find nothing I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress so that's just hey can't eat the Bible bro okay so that's uh that was one of the things we just talked about, being purified and getting rid of the sin and let not one um, escape, conquer them all, or more than conquerors through Christ. Same concept here. It's going to be hard for God to try you and not find anything, but this is the prayer that David's asking from God's own, from God's own self, straight out of his mouth. From 
God's throne to his heart out of his mouth. Right? I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, by the word of your lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Okay? We all should help keep ourselves out of the path of the destroyer. And I think usually we kind of have a feeling or an intuition or a prodding of the Holy Spirit to know when we're beginning to go in a bad direction. Listen to that still small voice. I didn't realize donkey's head so heavy. Um, Hold up my goings in your paths that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon you for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear unto me and hear my speech. Oh. Hey, no. Um. Show, this is verse 7. Oh, no. That's sweet. I saved the spot, yes. <laughs> um. <laughs> this is fun. Um, show your marvelous loving kindness, O oh, you that saves by the right hand of them which put their trust in you, from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. A lot of people say Israel is the apple of God's eye. Some people say believers are the apple. David believes he's the apple of God's eye, and I'm going to believe I'm the apple of God's eye too. If it's good for David, it's good for me. That's what I say. Um, so keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. From the wicked that oppress me. From my deadly enemies who compass me about. Uh, another way to say that is surround. So keep me from the, those wicked that oppress me and from my deadly enemies who surround me. And David was surrounded multiple times in combat situations, militarily speaking. Uh, they are enclosed, and he was trying to be assassinated for a long time. Uh, verse 10, they are enclosed in their own fat, with their mouth they speak proudly. Uh, they have now compassed us in our own, or in our steps. So now they've surrounded even our steps hard to run away or flee from your enemies when they're surrounding every step you take every move you make they were watching him verse 11 the second portion says they have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like verse 12 like as a lion that is greedy of his prey have you ever seen lions take a prey and they're not sharing with anybody Sometimes it might get stolen, but good luck stealing the prey from the lion. So as it were a young lion lurking in secret places, uh, or stalking. Verse 13, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is your sword. From men which are your hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life and whose belly you fill with your hid treasure. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. David, that's the end. David pretty much says, you can give them all the treasures that you have for this world, and you can fill their belly with those treasures. And they got a bunch of children, and you can give them all the offspring, and they can um, be numerous in their in their families. And they can rest in their substances and with their babes, right? You can give them all the blessings that this world has to offer, but their the men of this world have their portion in this life. David says, "I'll be satisfied when I awake with your likeness." Okay, that likeness comes in the. Um, afterlife okay think about the egyptians and other cultures that wanted to take their riches and wealth with them good luck with that <laughs> um you know so here he's saying give them everything in this life because that's all they're ever going to get and you can take everything from me but my satisfaction is going to come when i awake to resurrection or salvation 
not salvation, but resurrection. When he's resurrected in the likeness of Christ, that's what he's talking about. And that's where our portion waits. Our reward comes with Christ. Our reward's not in this world or this life. So don't look to be... Uh, I mean, I'm not saying you can't be blessed. I'm not saying you can't have those things. But what I am saying, though, don't have the expectation of that. You might not have wealth and health and those kinds of blessings. And I'm not saying God does or does not want that for you or will or will not provide those things. God will provide no matter what. But at the end of the day, our reward is when we're arisen into that resurrection body and we are as Christ is okay our reward isn't in this life to be getting all the money and to live 120 years or whatever it might be his will that you beat cancer it might not um, but s seek his will in these matters and be accepting whatever he chooses for you that's my advice so one thing I think I started to mention earlier was uh, the sword Jesus came to divide and truth divides untruth so and this is that scripture that's taken out of context is jesus um when he says that he i think the next scripture talks about i think the next scripture talks about um it'll be father against son and mother against daughter and those things he's given family divisions uh, in the family divisions it's literally if you are into truth, if you, especially if you're into God, and you have that truth, and you shit, ah. if you have that truth, it's going to divide people to where they're not going to hear what you have to say. They're not going to have the spirit. They're not going to hear the things of the spirit. And you can push and push all day long. You're never going to convince them to come to salvation. Only Christ will, and the Holy Spirit will have to do some kind of action. Uh, to do that, but you can plant seeds and you can water somebody else's seed plantings, but God ultimately brings the increase Now the thing I wanted to point out about that scripture is taken out of context is if you consider I think it was Peter that cut the ear off um, I think it was Peter that cut the ear off of the Roman soldier when they came to take Jesus away and God said hey you live by the sword you die by the sword Okay, so if you think about that, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. A life of violence will beget more violence. Evil begets more evil. Eye for an eye type deal. Ah, um, oh, my nose itches. Um, but I would say go to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at what the sword is. From a spiritual warfare perspective. Um, the sword, the sword is, which is the word of God. I mean, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? But you die to the flesh and you live in the spirit forever, eternal. So, or you can live by the metal sword and die by the metal sword and die forever in the second death. So, uh, choose you this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, not the gods on the other side of the flood or on this side of the flood. Um, and they're all around if you know how to look and with the eyes to see, the ears to hear. That's pretty much the only options, is God or everybody else, anybody else, or nothing else, but that's that, so let's get to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to fellowship together. We thank you for Mr. Spurgeon and the wisdom that you imparted to him before he departed from us. Uh, we thank you for uh, the great bountiful blessings that we get through his uh, sharing of his knowledge and wisdom and the teachings and his understanding of the word God um, we thank you for your holy wisdom and your godly truth that we can have people to share that with um, and people who are willing to listen and learn and grow in you Father, we just thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, that in that we can have grace, and the grace to conquer our enemies, rather it be internal in sin, or external in actual literal foes, like what David prayed about. God, we all have our issues and situations, and we just pray that in these times, God, that no matter what the situation or what the enemy is, that we can be uh, of a sound mind, and that we can be not of a spirit of fear, because you tell us in your word we're not given a spirit of fear. Um, that we can trust in you. That you're our shield and our buckler. That you go out before us. You are our stronghold. Um, <laughs> we thank you for the nature that you reveal yourself in. And your spirit. 
So I feel the calming and the peace even when it's a, he a little hectic. But life is fast and nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. So let us appreciate the moments when they come. Let us not lose our patience or our perseverance or our, our spirit of joy. You say the joy of the Lord is our strength, God, and I think in this world and in this day and age and indoctrination and all the negative things I could say about it, it's real easy for us to lose sight of you and to focus on ourselves and in focusing on ourselves, think about how things apply to us and how things relate to us and how it's putting us out. So let us keep our eye on you and focused on you, God, and in the little things in life that you reveal yourselves in. Let us slow our minds down. Let us find peace. Uh, you're the Prince of Peace, Jesus. So be with us and give us that peace that you are commanding and that you're um, sovereign over, you know. That's one of the component parts and it's also a fruit of the Spirit. So let the Spirit dictate to us and be bountiful in its fruit and harvest. Let us harvest those fruits and use them and apply them. Let us share them with others. <laughs> let us be servants to the servants. And let us have a humble heart and a pleasure to serve. Back the thing up, Cookie. <laughs> um, I just, I've got a big smile, God, and thank you for putting it on my face. Thank you for sharing with me all the things that you've shared. Thank you for being with me daily, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend this time with you and to share it with others so that others can be blessed by it. Thank you for all the new people that have come and that have gotten uh, spiritual food from you direct, or that have gotten a water of life that, that when they were thirsty, they were able to drink. God, I just thank you so much for that opportunity, and thank you for answering people's prayers, because you do. You're, um, um, you're a beautiful God, and you're a loving, kind God, and you're just and merciful, and you're a personable God that we can know. And we can know you are the Lord if we be still. So let us learn to be still. Um, in these times of turmoil, because it's the birth pangs are happening now, and they're going to increase just like a woman in labor or travail. So as the contractions of this earth get closer and closer before they birth the return of our coming Christ that's coming to conquer, let those birth pains be subdued by your Holy Spirit in us that believe, God. And let us be the lights in these darker times to know that we have our center and that we're grounded in you and in your truth and your word and in your spirit. And in being grounded in you, God, give us the peace and the love to go through these dark times without a care. Because we've already cast all our cares and concerns to you. And when times get hot or when things heat up, God, let us remind ourselves of that. And if we forget, please give us that um, direction in the Spirit. Because you can do anything. All things are possible through Christ. And everything that's evil and bad can be turned to a greater good for those that love you. Um... And Father, we love you, so whatever it is that you have in store for us, let it be made manifest in glorious ways that are not questionable, and that if any time we question our relationship with you, let us come to an understanding that you love us, and you want to know us, and you want us to know you, and you're a Father in heaven, and you want to spend time with us, if we would but spend the time with you. So let us remember that, God. Let us remember that a father loves his children and wants to spend time with them. Um, and you tell us in your word you can't lie. So if we find a word in the scripture and we apply it in proper context and it's your will, let us use your own words to dictate what is going to be our experience. And we have to have the patience to wait. And if we can just be having patience and endurance and perseverance, God, these are all qualities that you embody. Obviously, you've been patient with this world because otherwise it would have been condemned and judged and destroyed a long time ago. You've given us 2,000 years for grace, and you gave us many thousands of years before that to get to know uh, your, your will and to serve you and to come into your household. Uh, we read in the Proverbs earlier that a son that disappoints a father 
is not even as good as a servant who um, is wise and a servant that knows how to serve and a servant that knows how to glorify the household that he's serving. Now, we're in the house of God right now spending time with you. This is the church. The church is the fellow body of believers. You don't have to have a denomination or a title other than a follower of Christ. That's the only thing that is going to actually literally be what we know to be of a self-same spirit. We're not of the same spirit if we're not followers of Christ. And who are we to follow Christ if we can't love our God with all our heart and our souls and all of our mind? And who are we to, to call ourselves follower of Christ if we can't love our enemies? And if we can't love our neighbors as we love ourselves? And if we can't love the creation? Not more than the Creator, but you created it and it was good and I see your goodness in this creation. So thank you for revealing all of these things to me, Father. So I want to pray for, I think Melanie's the name, but you know her name. And I want to pray for her family. I want to pray for the family that got left behind for that uncle that was um, taken from us too soon. But God, you give us an appointment for death, an appointment for judgment. And when it's our time to go, it's our time to go. And something in this tragedy will be used for your purpose and your glory. Um, but for those that are, are left behind dealing with the wake of this destruction and this tragedy, we pray for all those that were affected. And that those people who were affected can keep their eye on you. Or if they don't know you, God, this can be an opportunity for you to be able to minister to their souls and their spirits. That they can be brought to salvation. And that they can be given the good news that... Um, you know, we can be resurrected. And if that's the case, just like the scripture told us, um, our reward is not in this life. When we're in the fullness of the glory of Christ, we'll be as He is. He's a living and loving God, and I can't wait to be as He is. And I'll try my best to follow Him in the process, but when it's time to die and to ar arise and wake up to eternal life, when it's time to be in heaven with the Father and the Son and the Spirit and all of the people who have come to salvation, one in the body, uh, it'll be such a, a reunion and such a glory to God. Uh, I look forward to that day. But until then, there's work to do. And we all would like to be about our Father's business to the best of our abilities. And where we fall short, God, meet us and make up the difference with us. So. I wanted to pray for Claudia, and I wanted to pray for, pray for Chrissy. I wanted to pray for 26. I wanted to offer up prayers for Sophia. I wanted to offer up prayers for a lot of people. I can't name everybody. Uh, Miss Sonia. I wanted to pray for uh, Gordon in particular. He's having some health issues. It's going to take a while to get resolved. And uh, God, I just ask you to be there with him and his family during this time because I know how frustrating some of the stuff he's going through can be. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he's got stage four cancer, God. Be with him. He's been through so much strokes and aneurysms, uh, brain surgeries, broken legs, burnt down uh, dwellings, and now to make it through all that, serving you and loving you only to receive a, a cancer, God, it's it's very disturbing to me. But you know what you're doing, and I trust in you. And I know he trusts in you too. Honestly, I, from what I've heard, he's ready to go home. But his family needs him. And God, if it's your will and pleasure to do so, please heal him. Heal him right now. And anybody else who needs healing, let him just receive it. And let the Spirit come in and do its thing. And if there's any unclean spirit that's in charge of these uh, infirmities or diseases or sicknesses or attachments let those things be cast out let them be removed let them be thrown down and let them be cast into the outer darkness until it's time for them to be judged God it's it's um, it's spiritual war and let us swing that sword of truth that only some can be cast out with prayer and fasting well we're offering up the prayers to cast them out and for whoever's fasting, let that be the second portion, if these spirits are strong enough to be residing anyways. But let, let the path of warfare be taken to a direction to where the power and the blood and the pleading 
and the dominion of Christ over the creation, including the evil entities, let those things be dealt with. And if it's a matter of genetics or physical predisposition or a lifetime of not treating their bodies correctly, whatever it is, God, you can heal that too. So let the genetics be healed. Let the infirmities and the sicknesses and the diseases and the chronic pains and let all of these things be uh, restored back to a place to where these humble servants and vessels of your love and mercy can be meet for the master's use and to be more serviceable in their capabilities because it's really hard to serve you and to keep focus on you when they have these distractions but if it's your will for them to suffer jesus suffered for all and by his stripes were healed so we claim that healing now but if it's your will not to be healed we also accept that as well so god we just offer all of this up in love and humility and meekness and in authority. And all these things we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Alright guys, y'all have a good evening. I love you all and thanks for praying with me. <laughs> I'll see y'all next time.